Tehran University of Astana and uh, a little bit of uh, Nazarbayev University. Uh, I would be more than happy to welcome uh, our minister on the podium, Rajan Bertano. to welcome a uh, prominent uh, WHO uh, uh, collaborator, Hans Kluge. Uh, affairs of the WHO. And uh, Ainura Ukhanova, uh, Chief of the and, uh, External or International Affairs. Uh, so uh, I will give uh, the role of moderator to Aidur and she will conduct further on our meeting. Thanks. Good morning, dear students. Uh, it is a great honor that we are meeting today uh, face to face with persons who make all the most important decisions in healthcare for our country, Kazakhstan, and for the entire European region of World Health Organization. Uh, opportunity for welcome speech to Minister of, uh, Minister of Healthcare of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Dr. Yeljan Rosanov. Good morning, dear colleagues, <coughs> dear friends. Uh, it's a big honor to be here to introduce you uh, my good friend and colleague, but also very important guest to our country. Uh, His Excellency Dr. Hans Kluger, the Regional Director for European Region of the World Health Organization. So let's give him one. <laughs> Dr. Hans Kluger was uh, elected by elections that happened uh, last year in uh, September in Copenhagen, where all 53 member states of the European region, including Kazakhstan, have participated, and uh, myself. On all ministers of health voted for him, among other six very strong candidates. So, and of course, uh, we are happy that uh, uh, in some transition period, finally, uh, two weeks ago, as far as I know, in Geneva, uh, Dr. Kruger was officially appointed and received his credential as the regional director for Europe in uh, WHO. So, uh, what is very important, and Hans uh, is always saying that during his stay, that actually directly from Geneva, as soon as he received his credentials, he rushed away, not to his office in Copenhagen, but to Central Asia, to Kazakhstan, to Nur Sultan, showing his attitude and importance of this region uh, in the, uh, I would say, family of European countries in this uh, division of uh, World Health Organization. I want to appreciate uh, Hans uh, you for this uh, really uh, very strong support and of course it's a very very important uh, visit uh, political I would say visit to our country as you know for, for several reasons first of all of course the issue of uh, global uh, emergency situation with the uh, outbreak of coronavirus infection so you all know as uh, doctors and the future physicians how important it is to undertake uh, evidence-based scientifically approved uh, measures to prevent distribution uh, of this infection and to fight uh, correctly with this infection. So the role of WHO is crucial, as you know, uh, because as you see at the beginning, every country was trying to make their own moves, and of course the biggest pressure was on the Chinese uh, uh, People Republic uh, to fight against this new challenge. So uh, I, I believe that uh, what we see is a new uh, understanding of global role of World Health Organization in such emergencies. They, uh, they were happening in the past, uh, and we know about SARS, MERS, Ebola viruses, and they, unfortunately they will happen in the future. But it's very important to know, uh, and it's very important to develop like integrated joint measures to fight against such diseases and such challenges. And we see how uh, WHO itself and uh, Director uh, General of uh, WHO, Dr. Tedros, uh, is really personally leading these global efforts to fight this uh, very serious disease and infection. 
So uh, for us, Kazakhstan is a neighboring country for Chinese uh, Republic. Of course, it's a big issue uh, to be able to protect our people, to be able to protect uh, not only citizens of Kazakhstan, but also uh, people who resident here, reside here, international society, including students, business people, people who work and live here from other countries, to be uh, in a safe place and to be able to diagnose and to treat if infection will happen. So I would like to appreciate uh, the support that we are receiving from WHO, our European office in Copenhagen from Thursday. Kazakhstan was one of the first responders actually. Uh, the first information about infection was announced by uh, Chinese healthcare minister Health on last day of December. And as soon as we started to work, 6th of January, Minister of Healthcare, uh, the Chief Sanitarian Doctor, Dr. Beshev, announced a strengthening of sanitary uh, measures to control the infection. Uh, and we're strengthening, uh, we're strengthening the border uh, between the Republic of Kazakhstan and China. We were looking all, monitoring all people who were entering. On the 30th of uh, January, uh, Dr. Tedros announced global emergency and we, uh, next day, I signed an order about the control over the whole border of Kazakhstan. So at the moment, we monitor thousands of people coming to our country, not only from China, but from 27 nations, countries where we do have uh, registered cases, and especially 11 of them, they have direct communication with our country. So thousands of people are monitored based on their homes, and you may read in some social media, some people react differently, some are happy, some are not, that uh, member of uh, staff from Polyclinic are calling them but that's how it works, actually. So we have to monitor those people. And in case of uh, doubt, we hospitalize and treat them. So it's a, it's a, it's an exciting situation, I would say. I would be very much happy to share in more details, but today is not my lecture. Uh, so I'm a little bit jealous because I've never been invited to make a lecture. That <laughs> So uh, another reason why it's so important is that uh, today we have a very strong discussion and that uh, related to yourself, to many of you, it's a new healthcare code, uh, the basic law constitution of our healthcare system as we said today during public hearings, the law that will regulate how our country will improve health, protect health and provide healthcare services. So, you know, there have been a lot of discussion on that from, you know, constructive to, uh, I would say, very aggressive. Uh, but uh, I think we are able to find uh, compromise solutions for all items of that new law. Just today, we, at the moment, uh, we're having uh, another public hearings with uh, representatives of uh, non-government organization, international society, and our clinical leaders on the document. But again, it is very important because Dr. Kruger yesterday met with our uh, leadership of our parliament, with the leadership of both chapters, uh, majorities uh, and parliament and senator of our parliament. Also met with Prime Minister Aslan Maimin uh, on that very important issue. So I, one more time, want to Thank you, uh, Mr. Kruger, for that really very important support that you are providing us at this moment. So, now I want to give the floor to uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Hans Kruger. Thank you very much. Uh, many thanks to uh, Professor Pavalkis uh, uh, for organizing, organizing this event. Yes. Um, so, Dr. Pavalkis, uh, I would like to first, on the rights of the host of this event, uh, greet everyone uh, in your premises with the uh, Rector of Medical University of Moscow. So, I will be short and not, not to over, uh, overtake as the, our Minister and uh, Dr. Kluge, but uh, using as a uh, 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 place where we conduct this meeting, I would say uh, some words uh, to, uh, to you and to others. Uh, last year, when uh, we changed the uh, 
governance of this university. We accept new uh, tendency of mission, a new vision for the future of university. And of course, keeping in mind uh, uh, nice uh, places, so what uh, you can see on the slides from uh, Sharin Canyon, total diversity of the uh, uh, views of the Kazakhstan. We have elaborated the key points from the, for the new strategy. Of course, it is uh, changing the undergraduate studies and postgraduate studies with compulsory residency. What was said uh, by the minister, uh, using the code, new code of the, uh, Kazakhstan, and of course, uh, doing everything what is could be done and even what could not be done to create university hospital for Astana Medical University. Uh, of course, not all the time it's uh, easy to uh, do everything, but uh, uh, our uh, university is doing quite well uh, in the numbers. Uh, if you look to the environment of university, it's probably the second university in the medicine what have the, so much of the students and uh, not only the, the students are as I always am telling it's an amazing country with a huge history it's all photos it's done by myself it's not from the internet or somewhere else so uh, starting from ESOE from here the hieroglyphs and uh, it makes a very interesting environment for the studies of the bachelor, master, PhD programs, programs from internship and residency. Of course, not everything is going smoothly like this Ili River or uh, climbing up to the Tenshan Mountains, which you can see one guy in middle, it's from the remote uh, WHO office in Almaty. Uh, for the primary health care following me. But uh, uh, our teaching staff is uh, quite big, is quite a uh, good uh, percentage of them having uh, uh, academical degrees and uh, conducting classes like in English for foreign students and general medicine and all of the programs. Of course, our infrastructure is not so well developed like uh, uh, skiing resort in Shimbulak near Almaty. Uh, but uh, 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 we have quite enough of facilities to do a good job for uh, teaching of our students, including educational labs, science labs, some vivarium, and uh, some other centers. Uh, as uh, all people, all animals and uh, uh, all universities are willing to have uh, collaboration. So uh, we have quite enough uh, of international partners uh, starting from Seoul National University and uh, this Glyphida University from Lithuania. Of course, uh, our level of university sometimes are quite different. Uh, sometimes we remain below uh, level of these universities, but we are doing, uh, I, I would say, quite good job to reach international standards of education and research. And uh, international projects are helping us quite a lot. Uh, of course, uh, not uh, everything is going smoothly and easy uh, because, uh, as you see in Nura River or in the swamps and the lake of Kurul uh, National Reserve, it, it, you sometimes feel quite difficult to move uh, forward. But anyway, thank you, Dr. Kluge, for coming and thank, thank you for the attention. So. Uh, Dr. Kowalkis, uh, now we finally uh, are, uh, have the honor to hear uh, directly Dr. Hans Kluge, who, by the way, has graduated with honors as a medical doctor in uh, medicine, surgeon, obstetrics, and also graduated with a tropical medicine um, a specialty with honors from Belgian Institute of Tropical Medicine, and worked as family medicine doctor in Belgium in your early career years. So it's very symbolic for us as champions of primary healthcare to have our true champion and a true professional, and uh, in addition to his native language, Dutch language, Dr. Kluge speaks fluently five languages. Dr. Uh, Kluge speaks English, French, German, and Russian languages.
там был такой сборник. Добрый день. Ай, Гуд, министр Бертанов, профессор Павалкис. Это большой престиж для меня, быть с вами здесь, в Астана Медицинском университете. I find it's always one of the highlights of my country missions. First of all, then I feel young myself. And secondly, we always get a lot of good questions because it is you, the students, who keep us on the top of our toes. So, dear director Aydur, I would like to express my sincere thanks for your kind invitation to meet the respected students here of the Astana Medical University I always say that the medical students are the future backbone of health systems in the WHO European region and elsewhere around the world. And in a world of changing population health challenges, rapid demographic and technological change, meetings such as this one today are really instrumental to enhance our shared understanding of the challenges we face in the century, but also of the opportunities that exist to address those through health professional education, training and continuous professional development. In recent years, people's lives have changed beyond measure, arising from globalization, migration and urbanization, climate change, resource scarcity and digitalization. Social and political norms which were accepted for decades are being questioned in the whole of Europe. Over 750 global experts and decision makers were asked to rank their biggest concerns in terms of likelihood and impact. And 78% said that they expect economic confrontations <coughs> and domestic political polarization to rise in 2020. And for the first time in the survey's 10-year outlook, the top five global risks in terms of likelihood were all linked to the environment, like climate change, environmental damage, biodiversity loss and natural disasters. Time will run out to address some of the most pressing economic, environmental and technological challenges. From that, I jump to health. In terms of threats to global health, the WHO issued a global report on the 10 threats to global health in 2019. I will not give all examples, but mention a few. Nine out of 10 people breathe polluted air every day. Pollutants in the air kill 7 million people prematurely every year from diseases such as cancer, stroke, heart and lung disease. The primary cause of air pollution, which is burning fossil fuels, is also a major contributor to climate change. Climate change is expected to cause 250,000 additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea and heat stress. Another one, non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, cancer and heart disease are collectively responsible for over 70% of all deaths worldwide or 41 million people. This includes 15 million people dying prematurely aged between 30 and 69. Another one, more than 1.6 billion people for 22% of the global population live in places where protracted crises through a combination of challenges such as drought, famine, conflict and population displacement and weak health services leave them without access to basic care. Another one, antimicrobial resistance, which is the ability of bacteria, parasites, viruses and fungi to resist medicines, threaten 
to send us back to a time when we were unable to easily treat infections such as pneumonia, tuberculosis, gonorrhea and salmonellosis. The inability to prevent infections could seriously compromise surgery and procedures such as chemotherapy. A particular one which we discussed while on being here on our mission was also multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And I'm very fortunate to have our team, Dr. Teresa Kasayeva, here on the first row, who is the director of the Global Tuberculosis Department at WHO Geneva. Vaccination is one of the most cost-effective health interventions available, saving millions of people from illness, disability and death each year. This is an issue, as Dr. Bertano was mentioning, which we discussed a lot during our high-level meetings, not at least also measles and HPV to prevent cervical cancer in girls and women. I always say there's an epidemic of different diseases, but there's also an epidemic of fake news. So as healthcare workers, as students, as future doctors, it is very important to bring right information to the population but in a way that the people understand, not to use always the jargon, but simple language to the people. An example from vaccines. Vaccines work. Vaccines save lives. We are a little bit the victim of our success because people forgot that polio can cause really paralysis, that measles can create infection of the brain, encephalitis, or even deafness. So we need to communicate to the people in a straightforward way. Dr. Bertano was also mentioning the very topical issue of the new coronavirus as public health emergency of international concern. I had the opportunity to visit the emergency operation center here in Astana and I must say I was very impressed by real life monitoring of the situation proactively calling people who are suspect and doing the contact tracing so congratulations Dr. Betanov and your government on this the Prime Minister was challenging me yesterday evening he was asking Dr. Kluge what will happen and what will be the situation in three months it will be finished or we have a worsening global epidemic. I had to fail to give the very complete answer because there are many unknowns. But still we believe that it is possible to contain the virus. And let's remember that 96% of all infected patients are in China and only 477 are in 24 countries around the world. Health professionals are the cornerstone of effective case detection and management. Health professionals are the frontline workers to identify potential cases, test and care for them, ensure infection prevention and control measures to put them in place in healthcare settings and provide public health advice to the people. Because of that, the health professionals are the critical asset of emergency preparedness for and response and need to be fully enabled and motivated to do your job. However, because of the very nature of their work, they might be at a high risk of infection. Thus, we must do everything we can to protect the healthcare workers and patients alike. And I want to take this opportunity to join the WHO Director General Dr. Tedros in acknowledging the hard work of the health professionals in China and in many countries like in Kazakhstan, across the globe, across Europe, for their dedication and commitment. Now let's go to the challenges in the WHO European region. As you may or may not know, the WHO European region in WHO's terms means 53 member states. 
going from Ireland to Vladivostok, my beloved Central Asia, Israel and Turkey. In the WHO European region, as elsewhere, we face also a number of health challenges. A rapidly aging population, an increased incidence of chronic conditions and multimorbidity, but still some so-called older diseases, like tuberculosis. Our region is the only one in the world where HIV is still on the rise, facing also environmental, social and economic pressures, large-scale migration and a information revolution which we should and will turn into opportunities. In Europe, we have a shared vision for universal health coverage to maximize health gains, reduce health inequalities, guarantee financial protection for the populations and individuals, and ensure an efficient use of societal resources through intersectoral and multi-sectoral actions where the whole of society and whole of government is to be involved. We can achieve this by transforming service delivery, putting the people in the center, not to have a doctor-centric health system, but a people-centered health system, which means that instead of the patient to adapt to the health system, it's the health system who is built around the needs expectations and choices by the people. Now I will say something on the WHO transformation. Last year, WHO announced the most wide-ranging reforms in the organization's history to modernize and strengthen WHO as the institution to play its role more effective and efficient as the world's leading authority on public health. The changes are designed to support countries in achieving the ambitious triple billion targets that are at the heart of WHO's 13 general program of work. One billion more people benefiting from universal health coverage. One billion more people better protected from health emergencies and one billion more people enjoying better health and well-being. What does it mean for tackling the health challenges in our region? As the region director of the WHO European region, my dream is that of a society where no one is left behind. A WHO European region where health is taken into account in major government policies to enable all people of all ages to live healthy lives. A region where people-centered and sustainable public health and healthcare services are available to all people. To achieve this, we have identified four priority areas to guide our work with countries and partners. The first priority is to tackle the main drivers of the disease burden. In fact, we have a triple burden. The non-communicable diseases, still the communicable diseases, and mental health. Dr. Bertano mentioned that there were six candidates for my post. I was the one of the six who pulled off a country visit to all of the 53 countries to listen to the Minister of Health and Foreign Affairs, what do they think works well with WHO and what could be improved. It was like a marathon, but it gave a lot of information. Mental health was mentioned from west to central to east. In adolescents, also in older people like dementia, Alzheimer. So mental health has to be tackled throughout the life course approach. Secondly, the second priority area for my vision is to address the determinants of health. Today, the main difference between being sick or healthy lays in fact outside of the health system. It has to do 
with environment, the way how you live, the way how your economic status is, do you have a job or not. So it's very important that we tackle health in a cross-governmental, whole-of-society approach. And Kazakhstan is leading the way here when we're talking to the heads of the lower chamber, upper chamber of parliament, to the prime minister, it was clear that the head of state is prioritizing health. Only in such a way will be able to improve health and well-being. Third priority to tackle the challenges in the WHO European region is putting the people first. Not by lip service, but by reality. I tell to my own staff, be a good listener. It starts to be a good listener. If you sit at a meeting, people are often so enthusiastically to tell their opinion that they don't even listen to what the other one has to tell us. And this becomes a big challenge in society. People have strong opinions and lost the ability to be a good listener. We are now talking about putting people first. My father was a chief traumatologist in Belgium, my mother a nurse. We didn't speak about people-centeredness, but they were practicing people-centeredness. It means that the patient is the VIP, the very important person. And the more vulnerable is the patient, a homeless, a bonge, an alcoholic, the more VIP you have to treat that patient. Fourth priority is leaving no one behind to safeguard all population groups. Health is a human right. And this is what you will do in a couple of years when you will swear the oath of Hippocrates. Now let me come to the role of the health workforce in health systems. As I was mentioning, the health workforce has a critical role to play in delivering the triple billion goals and tackling the challenges. You must be at the forefront of meeting those challenges. But it's not only the health workforce, it's the health and social care workforce, which is vital to the provision of high quality services. To bring health and social care is very important. In September 2017, the WHO Regional Committee, this is when, as Dr. Bertal was mentioning, in September the 53 ministers are coming together from the European region once a year, they adopted a resolution which is called Towards a Sustainable Health Workforce in the WHO European Region, a framework for action, very action-oriented, how to tackle the many issues of the health workforce. When I did my marathon campaign in the 53 countries to listen to the ministers, an issue which came up everywhere, whether in Belgium or Serbia or Ukraine or Russia, is sustainable health workforce. Not enough general practitioners in the rural areas, not enough nurses, so that's why we worked a lot on this action framework. In this context, the regional office is working with member states stakeholders and partners across the region to support efforts to achieve sustainable health workforce. So, for the future human resources for health, what is today's priority? It's education, training and continued professional development. Improvements in the population health outcomes in the region can only be achieved with a sustainable resilient health workforce, transformed with the knowledge, skill sets, competencies and behaviors to address the challenges. I always say, no health without health workforce. In 2013, WHO launched its first guidelines for transforming and scaling up health professions, educations and training at the third global forum on human resources for health. The guidelines identify nine areas for action. Faculty development, curriculum development, simulation methods, direct entry of graduates, admission procedures, streamlined educational pathways and ladder programs, interprofessional education, 
continue professional development and good governance and planning. You can find this all on the internet. A key experience, a key lesson learned for myself is that WHO has been focusing a lot on more and more production of healthcare workers, where sometimes we forgot to take care of the workforce which is already currently in the workforce to prevent them of going to other sectors to work, to appreciate them and nurture them. Of course, money is important, but it's much more than the money. Appreciation from the hierarchy to the healthcare workers to provide a nice environment with the latest instruments and technology. There is also in many countries what we call a feminization of the health workforce. So it's important to create a very good work-life balance for the female health workforce to support the family and still be able to do the work. Let me say something on the next slide on the technology and digitalization. Technology and digitalization or influencing the way the health workforce is taught and how health services are delivered. We were visiting yesterday a primary healthcare clinic and I was very impressed when Deputy Minister Abhishek was showing really how the apps are being used to have a seamless uh, continuity of the health information. Now, Kazakhstan is moving forward, but just like any other country, there are many, many challenges, many challenges. But the technologies are vital to establish efficient and well-functioning health systems also to empower the patients as part of a decision maker into their care and ensuring that health information is available when and where it is most needed. They also can enable health professionals to have more time to do what they do best and to be less busy with the papers. 4 and 5 March, so very soon, at the WHO Regional Office in Copenhagen for Europe, we will have the second symposium on the future of digital health systems in the European region. And we discussed with Dr. Bertano a solid representation by Kazakhstan at the high level forum, because there's a lot, a lot to share. Some of the key messages will be the importance of increasing digital health literacy. Remember, leaving no one behind, so that there may be a part of the population who is not comfortable with this, so digital health literacy. The need for structured education programs for health professionals and students, and I'm sure that Professor Pavaltis is taking care of this. And third, health professionals to lead health technology development. Dear colleagues, I'm concluding. I was very fortunate that I had more than five minutes, Professor, because this is a great opportunity to speak to you, but also to listen. So please, Dr. Ayur, I think, will invite probably for some questions. But let me also wish you the very best in this very important phase of your life. Take the study very seriously. Not all people in the world have the opportunity to be educated. I myself am from Belgium. I did not realize this so much. I thought this was an acquired right until I started to work all over the world, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in North Korea, that this is a great gift to have the professors committed to be in such a fantastic environment and to take it very seriously. Because ultimately, you will have the most beautiful job there exists. It is to ensure that health is a human right. Without health, no national security, no economy, no social cohesion. The World Health Organization is very proud of you. Thank you, Rahmat Spasiba van Borsha. Our audience has truly enjoyed. Uh, just to tell you who is in the audience, it's not only Medical University of Astana, 
um, it is also, uh, we invited, for example, students from Nazarbayev, Nazarbayev University, and uh, also some young professionals who work uh, in healthcare, for example, the public and center. So we try to bring as many as possible. Uh, and uh, mainly those who study public health, health uh, administration, uh, also some medical professions. And so now uh, the floor is open to questions and answers. Uh, we have uh, at least 15, 20 minutes for questions and answers, and then we have a, a nice uh, closing section with uh, official ceremonial part. So please, the floor is open, dear students, dear attendees. Please, you have. Uh, Excellent opportunity, same as with the Prime Minister of Kazakhstan, to ask questions directly, <laughs> directly to Dr. Kruger, please. <laughs> Microphone is on the stage. Don't be shy. Yes? Uh, a student behind on the left, please. The microphone, yeah. Uh, Dr. Kruger asks you to introduce yourself, your name, what you study here, or study. Yeah, it's okay. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Mohammed Amr, and I would like to say that we are very fortunate to have you among us. So my question was that, uh, have we as an international community, or the WHO for that matter, done enough to deal with the mental issues like depression, which are on a rise among the youth, and what are we doing about it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my colleague and my dear friends. I, this is a very, very important question, as I was mentioning, that mental health was mentioned during my campaign, campaign tour time and again. It is very, very prevalent, not only in this country, in Belgium, in all countries. Two weeks ago, I was invited by the Minister of Health and Care Services of Norway, to Oslo, Minister Bent Hoyer, and they have a new phenomenon that 44% of the girls and boys are having signs and symptoms of anxiety and depression, and statistically significant, much more in girls than in boys. And they don't know why. Obviously, they are studying this. There are some hypotheses, like, for example, whether for young girls, the social media and all these likes and uh, trying to be perfect on the social media may also put a lot of pressure or whether all these youngsters now sleeping uh, in their beds with their phone and having a chronic deprivation of sleep. I know what I talk about because I have two daughters, uh, Nastya and Sofia, Gavrik Paruski, and one 14 and one 16 and it is a constant battle to, to shut off. So we don't know. And then, of course, there's a lot of countries starting with suicide. I, myself, this is one of my four flagships. The flagship means a lot of attention by the WHO director itself. And I'm very grateful that the Queen of Belgium will champion this in the region to boost political commitment. She has been appointed by the United Nations Secretary General as the global SDG advocate on mental health. Having said that, all of us have to work on this. If I see in the healthcare workers or WHO staff, still a lot of stigma and discrimination. I will give you an example. Three weeks ago, one very senior person got a burnout. And there was a lot of gossiping. Oh, how can the senior person have a burnout and this and that? And then the person was recently diagnosed with a brain tumor. So then, of course, many people feel themselves very, very bad. So we ourselves as the healthcare worker have to eradicate from ourselves this stigma and discrimination. Thank you and congratulations for a fantastic question. Yes, next question please. Can okay, I? On the right side. Yes. Hello, my name is Abba Khan. I'm the student of healthcare system. Public health care. So my question is more about our country. Uh, so we facing the uh, suicide in our country uh, a lot because, like uh, by the statistics, there is uh, like Kazakhstan leading uh, in uh, <coughs> Central Asia between suicide. 
So um, my question will be like, is there any mental health care ta uh, tasks uh, in our new system? This is very specific to your country, which I respect very much. So as I'm sitting with the Minister of Health, Dr. Bertanov, I would like to pose this Kazakhstan specific question to his Okay. Uh, Thank you, Abbasan. Very, very important question at the moment. Uh, yes, uh, it is uh, very sad that uh, Kazakhstan is among the leaders in uh, suicides among the youth. Uh, just a few months ago, we had a special session on, uh, organized by UNICEF in uh, Europe uh, when we talk, We met actually with representatives of youth and they were talking about what are the reasons uh, bringing uh, them uh, to that uh, strategic uh, tragedies. And, and uh, in fact, it was very interesting to know uh, how many actual reasons could be there. It's not only just the maybe traditional issues uh, that interpersonal relations, but also even more profound deep ethnic, uh, you know, religious, economic issues that cause uh, such problems. And uh, uh, what uh, we are doing here, I think one of the learnings for me, it was like we have to build a system that are able to early detect signs of uh, depression and signs of mental disorders, not diseases, even disorders that will potentially lead to suicide, suicidal attempt and suicide. So uh, there are several steps, I just will say about a few of them. First, we have developed together with UNICEF a national program on suicide prevention together with uh, Ministry of Education and local authorities, which actually looks like a special algorithm that teachers at school can use and school psychologists can use to uh, evaluate, survey uh, pupils at school, students at school, and to uh, tackle those who have some issues where we need more deep investigation with the help of professionals, psychologists, and psychiatrists. So uh, the program that started in Kozlorda region a few years ago showed extremely good results. Uh, then we started to expand, uh, and currently we are trying to expand it in all regions, but it takes a lot of efforts. So here we have another problem of uh, uh, really uh, being uh, able to implement on full size uh, and fully according to the standard of the program, because it requires a special training for you know uh, staff of schools, special training of staff of primary health institutions. So we are working on that. The second thing, of course, also uh, regarding the legal perspective. Uh, it is very important to regulate, which is called a regular general practitioner to be able to uh, detect the signs of uh, mental disorders and depressions. In the past, it was only the role of psychiatrists to do that. But now we are changing the law, and it's a lot of misunderstanding of that uh, suggestion and discussion about that. that uh, General practitioners, as soon as the law will be adopted, will be allowed and will be able to uh, see and to detect and uh, uh, to monitor patients among the assigned patients who has some uh, issues, mental issues, I would say, mental disorders, signs of depression, uh, signs of uh, uh, early signs of disease, and then uh, bring uh, that issue to specialists, to parents, and to start. Uh, doing more, I would say, uh, uh, necessary actions to treat, etc., to provide uh, additional help. And the third very important issue that, according to our law, you cannot get any kind of medical service until you are 18 without your parents. And that's the biggest problem because one of the most common causes of suicide among youth is health problems, you know, unplanned pregnancy. Uh, sexual transmitted diseases, depression, etc. And we don't allow our youth to go to the doctor. Because we have, uh, if you have some issues, you will come to your doctor and he will say, I cannot, I'm not allowed to, to help you. You have to bring your parents. And that's a problem because in many cases, uh, especially in rural areas, people are ashamed to talk about this problem with their parents. So what we are changing now, uh, we are decreasing that age, I would say level from 18 to 16. So uh, hopefully as soon as the law will be uh, adopted, every person uh, uh, older than 16 
can go to his to the doctor and ask the question. It could be gynecologist, you know, urologist, psychiatrist, psychologist, any kind of doctor, and uh, the doctor will be permitted to provide medical services, advice, prevention services, except that required surgical procedures, including abortion. So that was not support. But at least we will have opportunity to uh, see, uh, to test, uh, to uh, diagnose uh, such problems that uh, really help us to reduce suicidal attacks. Thank you. Uh, I, I Dr. Kluger for sure knows that uh, coming from Lithuania, which in 25, 20, 25 years ago was a leader along with uh, Hungary in the suicide rate in the world. So I would say, what, uh, except what the very correct, correctly said the uh, minister, uh, it decreasing of the tension inside the society and the tensions in between the different social groups was the main uh, acting point. When we entered the European Union, uh, everything started, looks like we settled down. So uh, suicide rate quickly, quickly dropped down. So we, we should keep this in mind as well. Thanks. Thank you. We have one more question. From, uh, good afternoon. My name is Gunnur, and uh, I'm from Public Health uh, Student Representatives of the Right University first year. And uh, uh, my question is also for Minister, Minister of Health mostly. Uh, I'm from Karadinda, and uh, when you go by car to Karadinda, you pass near the Timotel city. And uh, there are a lot of factories, as you know, and when you pass it, you see very dark clouds of air that is going from factories. And uh, this is the problem of air pollution, yes. And uh, my concern is why this problem is not solved yet, because these factories are here, like, they're for a long time and this problem is not new and uh, the main purpose of healthcare is to prevent, yes, and uh, how this problem is not solved yet and why. And uh, I also want to know what steps will be done in order to prevent this. And not only in Smithal, I'm pretty sure that in other countries or other cities of Kazakhstan we have this problem. And uh, I want to hear what you need answers, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Uh, very important question that was also uh, uh, Dr. Kluge mentioned in his presentation, the issue of uh, public health, safety, and uh, air pollution. So I would say that, unfortunately, it's not only a Tiemekan. It's a global problem. Uh, air pollution and uh, the ability of uh, governments society to protect themselves from air pollution is a global and a huge issue. It's, uh, it's on a very high political level. So, of course, because there is always a fight between, uh, I would say, people who protect health and people who protect the economy. And that's true. And the same fight happening now in Kazakhstan, for example, for tobacco control. We were just discussing today about this. Where from one hand, uh, we have industry that provides working places, uh, labor force, salaries, taxes, etc. From other hand, we have health issues. So the, the biggest, uh, I would say, challenge is to find the consensus or to find uh, the ways how governments will be able to solve such issues. And I agree, we, have, uh, we need some sort of level of maturity in our society, in Kazakhstan. First of all, on the legal level. So of course, we have to set up very good standards for uh, ecological standards for uh, industry, but at the same time we have to be able to operate, manage those standards, to control over the standards. So that meaning that we have to have very strong institutional capacity in, um, I would say, hygiene system. We had pretty good system in the past, uh, many years ago, uh, I would say during Soviet Union, and where the basics of uh, industrial health care uh, and hygiene was set it up. But now, of course, uh, we have to realize that we really need to review the infrastructure of our public health services, especially uh, to review all standards. Because many standards, we still use standards that were adopted in the 1970s and 80s. So what we are doing now is, uh, as you know, we have created a special institution called 
uh, committee for control of uh, safety and quality of goods and products, basically the combining sanitary and pharmaceutical inspection and inspection for medical services. So currently we established uh, a special, uh, it's not only about you know, having civil servants inspectors to control, but having really evidence-based, research-based, scientific approach to handle the problem. What would be a safe level of, um, you know, of that pollutants in the area? What would be safe level in the soil or water? We need to review all standards. We need to be able to, uh, to test the laboratory, laboratory services, and then we need to be able to uh, use, I would say, evidence-based uh, solutions to close or to avoid to keep the distance different uh, measures. So now we. Uh, approaching this issue by creating a research base, scientific center. We have established a national center for public health, where I would like to invite you all who are interested to come and join this center because we are filling a serious gap with experts, national experts, scientists, researchers. We uh, will be, we currently actually, just in December, we had a meeting of brainstorming with the new leadership of that center uh, to be able to address such issues, including occupational medicine. So, uh, but the fact is that we don't have any uh, young generation of scientists, although we have many people with a uh, Bachelor of Public Health and Master of Public Health degree. So, my answer will be, come and join us to solve this problem. Thank you. Next question, please. students from the Bath University and actually I have two questions, one for uh, Dr. Pilke and one for our Minister of Health. So the first question is, um, as you have mentioned before, uh, nowadays we pay a lot of attention on person's health and on each individual. individual. And uh, to what extent WHO at uh, European region considers personal medicine effective in order to um, treat non-communicable diseases. And the question for you, Mr. Health, is uh, what actions are done uh, in undertaken in Canada also um, regarding personal health? Personal medicine. Personalized medicine. Personalized medicine. Thank you for the topical question. So it links a bit with what, uh, one of the flagships in my vision, which I touched upon, which is digital health and innovation. In fact, at the symposium, the 4th and 5th March, we'll have also a session on artificial intelligence and personalized medicine. So this is a very quickly evolving field that WHO, as such, does not have a policy yet. That's why the European region wants to be very proactive on that one, to help shaping the debate and the policy. But as a principle, we are the kind of the normative, let's say, Watchdog also, from public health point of view, that such a personalized medicine development should never increase inequities, but in fact decrease inequities. So that if you have it, it is to be available for everyone, but also that it does not contribute to breaking the budget of the health system. So there's still many unresolved, unresolved questions and many hot debates, also on the cost, but it certainly, in my view, has a tremendous potential to help making the paradigm shift from a health system which is almost solely focused on curative clinical care to a system which is preventative, which focuses a lot on prevention. To my knowledge, there are only two countries out of the 53 which have integrated first-line medicine universally in a primary health care and Israel and the United Kingdom where they can, where they are stratifying the population to predict, for example, who will develop renal insufficiency and by predicting this, being able to have personally tailored approaches. But it should in any case not take away resources from the population based public health. Thank you. Personalized medicine is uh, 
one of the, I would say, the, uh, topics that under the uh, close view of our government, as you know, uh, our first president, Osama uh, Zabai, even in his speech a couple of years ago, he stressed that we need to develop personalized medicine in, in our country. So, and I know that uh, there are studies done in, uh, ongoing in Nazarbayev University. So, uh, and you all know what is personalized medicine, so I'm not going to details on that. So what we are doing now, uh, actually this year, we have a full budget uh, for three years national uh, research study called uh, Implementation of Personalized Medicine in Healthcare of Kazakhstan. Uh, it uh, has a tremendous budget uh, approved by already by the government, 12 billion in here for three years, 5 billion for this year. Uh, the program was uh, created by the group of scientists from more than 20 research uh, and uh, clinical institutions of Kazakhstan, led by Kazakh National Medical University, Azerbaijan University, Medical University of Astana, Karaganda, National Center for Biotechnology, and other uh, research centers. Uh, it's already planned and ready to start. So we expect to have a government decision on launching this program, hopefully in February or early March. So when we will start uh, doing a massive national research uh, including uh, genetic testing, so we can call it sort of genomic Kazakhstan. Uh, you know that many countries already launched such program like genomic England, France, Germany, South Korea, China, US, and Israel. So, and the idea is actually to have uh, as much as possible genomic genetic information and to uh, merge it with uh, information that we have in our electronic healthcare systems. We do have a lot of data in our electronic health system because we are maybe not among many countries that have introduced electronic health record. So all of you, you already have your own personal electronic health record. And uh, uh, if you can also always look uh, at that uh, for your ego uh, mobile application. And it will be collecting more and more data on your health Starting from as soon as the baby was born, we will start collecting this information on a special assignated assigned server by the government. The, we cannot really go fast because we need again we need to put it in a health code, and it's in there. And we are discussing that that government of Kazakhstan uh, will be responsible for protecting the data, data. But as soon as we will start getting uh, genetic information on the structure of, uh, I would say, genes of a particular person and his healthcare data that we have uh, in a massive of millions of people uh, in local in Kazakhstan, we will be able to, together with international of course, uh, research scientists, to use that in practice. Uh, some sort of personalized medicine already launched. For example, last year, we officially introduced in the uh, state guaranteed free medical services for cancer, genetic testing for three types of cancer. So lung cancer, uh, breast, uh, breast, it was in the past, but uh, skin cancer, and I think uh, uh, another one, I don't remember exactly, but based on the uh, genetic analysis of that particular tumor, uh, we are introducing uh, a specialized targeted treatment with monoclonal antibodies uh, that we included in the free medication list of almost 20 of them during the last few years. The extremely expensive medications and people with melanoma now are tested <coughs> genetically on their tumor and treated based on the result of the such genetic test. So, which is a sort of uh, technology that already widely available in many countries. But now we want to go deeper, so we will start this research. Uh, but we are very practical, so starting from 2022, the government already allocated a serious amount of budget that is already approved in the law to start implementing that on the primary care level. So we are planning to provide the necessary genetic testing for all children on birth to start collecting these data and be able to use that for implementation of personal methods. Thank you.
Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Shudas. I'm from Kagan American University. I'm a master's student at uh, Dr. Hansa. Uh, I would like to congratulate uh, with your new post. Uh, and uh, so, uh, one of the uh, aims of sustainable, uh, sustainable development goals. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sustainable development goals is uh, uh, to decrease the level of non-communicable diseases. Uh, and uh, as, I, uh, as I know, as I think, um, it has a direct correlation with health literacy. And uh, I would like to ask, uh, ask you uh, to tell about the best uh, practices uh, to improve and increasing the level of health literacy in your opinion. Thank you. Another great question, please. On only great questions today. So, I understand that the question was in the last part, right? The efforts to increase health literacy. Best practices. Best practices. So, I will have four flagships in the vision. I mentioned already about the mental health. I mentioned about the digital health and innovation. The third one will be the immunization 2030 agenda. And the fourth one relates to your question is that for the first time in WHO, globally, we're going to establish a unit on behavioral insights. So there's a lot of good practices on health literacy, but health literacy is very important, is very useful, but sometimes it also departs from thinking that the persons are not literate. They don't know which healthy choice to make for smoking, for alcohol. But often what we see is that people know they are literate, but still they do not follow rational behavior in making choices about health, including sometimes over self. So in fact, the industry is putting a lot of money into behavior insights. It's to understand better why do people depart from rational behavior in making healthy lifestyle choices. I would like to do with a good team the same, to better understand, taking advantage from the latest science in behavioral economics, anthropology, sociology, to understand what people think, why they behave in a certain way, to be able to advise governments on policies to create an environment and literacy that people, in fact, are driving towards the healthy lifestyle. Uh, so this is uh, the initiative which is going forward and if next time I'm here and Dr. Eisdor and the Professor invite me again, I hope to give you very good practices. Could I ask something to this question? It's a very interesting question. But on opinion of WHO and your personal, who should promote uh, this behavioral medicine in the society? It's primary health care, it's some specialist on behavioral medicine, it's uh, all physicians or what's on educational and implementable problems. Thank you, Professor. For me, this is what we call a whole of society approach because my vision is to have a European culture of health, a European society where we have a culture of health. It means that everyone in society whatever age and economic means, is enabled and literate to make the healthy choice. And that definitely means that all of you need to be very well versed into this matter. A lot in the primary health care, because that's for many people the first point of contactive care. But also the specialists. We have, for example, a project which is called Health Promoting Hospitals. Because we know that specialists also have a big authority among the population and that people also, in many cases, listen to them. So I think, Professor, it's a whole of society responsibility. So, maybe final question? Or? Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Ain Aokebu from Nazarbayev University, uh, first year master student. Um, uh, His Excellency, the auditorium, the question is for you. I actually want to know the role of the, in general, WHO as regards the novel coronavirus. 
uh, as well especially in collaboration with uh, other partners from other regions. What are the, st what's the statements, what are they doing, apart from what these individual countries are doing? Because I remember in 2014, uh, I'm from Nigeria, when the uh, Ebola virus hit us, we experienced a bit of slow uh, uh, actions from the WHO. Right now, this is new, this is uh, novel. What are the plans? What are the steps? Thank you for a very timely question, and I fully acknowledge what you're telling that there are many lessons learned, and many painful lessons learned from the Ebola crisis, which, among other things, had to do. I think two issues is that the essential public health functions in particular countries were not strong enough, but also WHO, the uniqueness of all organization, which I think is its beauty, is that we're the only United Nations agency which has three levels. We have a central level, headquarters in Geneva, then we have six regional offices. I'm in charge now of the European regional office based in Copenhagen, Denmark. And then we have 150 country offices, including in Kazakhstan. And I would like to take the opportunity to introduce Dr. Caroline Tarnval, who is representing WHO here. Maybe Caroline, for a second, you can kindly stand up. So, one of the things that we learned is that when an emergency is declared by the Director General, IMS is, is triggered. IMS stands for Incidental Management System. It means that all the three levels of the organization are in a strict reporting line. Concrete, every day, also this day, between 12 and 12.30 in Geneva, there is the Health Security Council where the Director General is speaking to the six regional directors and the senior management. So this means already that information and intelligence is being shared on a real-time basis. This is very important because there are many things we don't know yet about the virus. This is one. And then secondly, we are also, I was mentioning in fact that the press conference this morning, this week, was a two-day meeting in Geneva where WG convened the major players of the private and public industry in research and development to coordinate vaccine and treatment development. That's a very important role as well. And then, of course, like in Kazakhstan, country by country, we are working to strengthen the readiness, the capacities of the laboratory to do additional training, also shipping a lot of personal protective equipment and diagnostic kits, which is of real health and guidelines. So I believe that uh, the lessons have been learned. Yesterday was the meeting of the 28 minutes of health of the European Union, where I was to be a key speaker, but I told my brother, Dr. Bertanov, I gave my word to come first to Kazakhstan, and I came to Dusseldam and sent someone else to Brussels. But the feedback there, from some very critical countries is that WHO learned its lesson. Ultimately, it's a very difficult situation. Sometimes I think for Dr. Cedros, the Director General, I mean, if you're too quick and you declare an emergency very quickly, and it's not an emergency, you're blamed by the countries that they have to stop fire vaccines. If you wait, they say, but he's too close with the death of that country and it's under influence. So it's a little bit like in politics, but I'm following what our leader in WHO is doing, and I have a lot of respect for him. He's also going to the field. He's evacuating in his helicopter, sometimes patients themselves against the advice with him to walk the talk. So in that sense, if there's any advice from all of your other ones, we are an open mindset organization willing to learn continuously just like you have to undergo continuous professional development. Um, at this point, I think we will uh, round up our discussion. Uh, on the forum row, I have my colleague, Saudia. She can take additional questions who didn't have time to ask, and then we can still get answers from you. We are in touch, and then give back these answers to students. But now, uh, before we move to a nice closing ceremonial part, uh, I would like to make one announcement that we have uh, prepared a good announcement for our students. 
Uh, I was told yesterday in the interview that uh, you have discussed it, it with uh, our Prime Minister and also according to your request by the new acting uh, head of Kazakhstan's country office of World Health Organization, Dr. Carolyn Corinwell, uh, there is the following announcement. Uh, all the students here in the room, also in the whole country, please follow that uh, we will uh, post this uh, contacts on the Facebook account of Ministry of Health and uh, Country Office uh, that we are uh, asking uh, interns, like those who would like to work and have internship at the Country Office of World Health Organization, which is in Nur Sultan, as well as in geographically dispersed office on primary health care of World Health Organization in Almaty. We invite you all to apply for internships and have uh, up to six months of internship with great experience with world-class team of professionals of World Health Organization here in Kazakhstan. You can do it as a student as well, as, uh, as interns, as well up to you graduate and have your degrees. Uh, the second part is uh, you could apply and work as consultants at the country office. We were requested by Dr. Kwanabal to find the professionals uh, as well as GDO according to your procedures, apply it as consultants. Also, uh, with responsible secretary of Minister of Health of Kazakhstan, uh, Dr. Botagos Raksilekova, there is agreement with Boloshak Scholarship to fund internships by Boloshak Scholarship to have a stajerovka or it's like internship practice uh, between six months up to two years in European Office of World Health Organization in Copenhagen where uh, Dr. Hans is now the new head as well as at headquarters. So government of Kazakhstan can sponsor these internships, professional internships. Uh, and as well, we invite students uh, to volunteer and work as interns in the Department for Strategy where we work in the Ministry of Healthcare to learn from direct experience in ministry. Um, uh, so this is our announcement. And so please follow Facebook page of Minister of Healthcare. And please follow on Facebook, Dr. Hans is very active. Uh, uh, you can learn a lot from Dr. Hans's tweets on Twitter and Facebook posts, as well as Minister of Health official account, as well as uh, European and country office of WHO. Please be active on social media so you'll learn all of these details of this announcement later. And now, we move to the very um, expected part. Um, the rector of Medical University of Astana, Dr. Dainis Pavalkis, will now uh, give the honorary professor title. And please, Dr. Pavalkis, you want to Very short speech. Very short. As uh, uh, Dr. Hans Kluge has said, uh, if you will invite, we are doing that. We are granting, according to the decision of Senate, uh, him the honorary professorship of our university. And it means you should come again and you should talk to our students again. Engagement 
there are uh, member states, 147 member states, uh, adopted uh, historic Astana Declaration of Family Healthcare that now is one of the, became one of the major documents globally. I just want to add that uh, uh, last year in Geneva on the World Health Assembly, Astana Declaration was officially welcomed and adopted by World Health Assembly. In September last year, uh, Astana Declaration was entered and put on the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly, a uh, special high-level meeting on uh, universal health coverage. So now it's official document, and now we are uh, just a few minutes before actually adopting uh, action plan, so-called uh, operational framework for implementation of Astana Declaration that we expect to adopt in May in Geneva again with the whole Minister of Health here. So the role of uh, Mr. Kruger is huge uh, globally, but also for healthcare system of Kazakhstan. And it's my big honor today on behalf of uh, all healthcare system of Kazakhstan to award Dr. Kruger with a special award that we have for a while uh, for valuable input for development of healthcare system of Kazakhstan. And I think he deserved that. So uh, I want to thank you and with my big pleasure to give you this award. celebrate the 175th anniversary of Abai Kunanbai. Abai has been Kazakh's most and poetry. So this is a souvenir uh, of Abai, statuette of Abai. He is our forefather, a reformer of culture, education, and literacy in Kazakhstan.